I'm going to bring on our next guest. We're starting with Mark McElroy. Mark, hey, how you hey, doing? Nick. I'm fine. How are you? Not not too bad. Uh, it's great to have you here. You're going to talk about the, uh, I believe, the Pitcher List Auto New League that you started last year, correct? Yes, and it's a rookie Auto New League. I want rookie. to point that so out. That means yes. only people who have never done it before. That's right. Oh, man. Okay, so the title of this, I believe, is 12 Lessons We Learned in Our Auto New Rookie League. And it wouldn't feel right talking about it without Justin Viver and Niv Shaw. Uh, thank you guys for being back once again for PitchCon. We got the entire trio from last year's panel. <laughs> Thanks for having us back. Yeah, Nick. Of course. Really happy to be here. And, and Chad Young was earlier today as well. So it's a real, the trifecta <laughs> is here. I'm going to let you guys uh, take it away here. And thanks again for being a part of PitchCon. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so I am uh, want to point out if you missed Chad Young's presentation earlier about auction strategies and you're interested in Autonew, go and listen to that presentation. It was incredible. Uh, he had lots of really great tips and uh, advice. Um, he, Hunter Dennison, and uh, Eric both all had great ideas. So uh, go check that out. Um, first thing I want to do, Niv, is uh, wish you a happy anniversary. Thanks. Um, yeah, what, Valentine's Day, so six days ago, uh, Autonew turned 10, which is incredible. <laughs> Did you uh, think that you would get to 10 years? Uh, I, man, no. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, there's a lot of uh, sort of sheer will and uh, a lot of people who have been really supportive the whole time. So it makes it a lot easier to, to get to this point. But when I, when we started talking about this stuff, there's no way I thought uh, this would be a real business for 10 years with fan graphs and with, and with you guys, you know, just deciding to play it and stuff like that. It's just awesome. It's great. Yeah. And uh, I guess I need to congratulate you as well for f filling up the uh, Prestige League. Yeah. So we just launched a new game uh, last Monday and it already sold out. It is a 240 team uh, giant tournament. You think of it as like a golf tournament before the All-Star break. You got to make the cut um, every month. And then uh, March Madness after the All-Star break, just going to be a wild uh, best ball tournament after that. I'm really excited for the format. I think um, you know, as we talk a little bit more about um, the basic auto new fantasy baseball game, like we can talk more about how Prestige League like fits into some of the stuff. It's just going to be really great. Super excited. Yeah, it's, I'm. I put in my team for better or for worse. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and, that's gonna uh, be fun. I'm just going to see. You know, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing I wanted just to start off with is to let everybody know if uh, last year's PitchCon we did this. Um, and we basically talked about the introductions to Autonew, what it is, what the rules are, the, just the basics. Uh, that was when we didn't really have, I didn't really have any idea about how Autonew worked. I was a total rookie and I had recruited 11 other players in the pitcher, league, pitcher list community to join me. And uh, we all went through this process together. So um we're just going to talk about some of the things that we learned and pass on those strategies. Um, I'm going to throw them to you two um, and uh, just kind of hear what you have to say. Sound good? Sounds good, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so lesson one. In first year auctions, set two or more days to auction. What do you guys think about the auction in first year drafts? Yeah, I mean, and, and I think the the key takeaway with that is that a first year auction in Autonew is typically eight to nine hours, maybe seven to nine hours. If you're if you really know what you're doing, you can get it done in seven hours in a first year league. Um, that's an awfully long time to try to fit it into one night. I know leagues that have done it, but I agree. I think the best option is to to pause it halfway or some portion of of the auction and then pick it up on another night. Um, because it is, it's, it's, it's a lot of focused. I mean, unlike a, a draft, you kind of have to pay attention to everything that's going on at every moment to make sure you're not missing out on an opportunity to, to be in on a player. So I think that makes it a lot more of a fatiguing draft in, when you're doing an auction than, than when you're doing a snake draft where you can just kind of wait until your pick comes up and then pick whoever you think is the best player left. But uh, you have to have a little bit more focus with, with the auto new auction. So. Yeah, I think also, uh, you know, the system is set up to acknowledge all this stuff, right? Like you can pause your draft anytime, take a break. You can take a two hour break middle of the day. You can um, take, pick it back up a week later, like whatever you need to do. Um, the other thing is that, 
you know, Justin's totally right. Like those, those first year drafts are really long. Um, it's just unavoidable. It's actually a ton of fun, but, oh, yeah. but by the end of it, it's exhausting. So, so there's other options to like, if you start, if you start your draft, you can just say, we're going to do these hundred or so players or these 200 or so players, like get everyone's roster half filled and then move on to like the in season auction and the stuff that like, uh, is a little bit less times, uh, like, require or maybe devotion like doesn't require as much devotion and like attention all the time so it gives you a little bit more flexibility so uh just take advantage of the tools on the platform to to be able to uh take your time doing this because i think fatigue like you nailed it like fatigue will mess you up in these drafts and it doesn't take seven hours to get to that point of where you're starting <laughs> to overbid um or underbid or miss something um, and then, yeah, the break to evaluate your team is, is actually a really great point too. Like understanding where you are during the draft, like you, you're in a fog of war just cause it's all happening in front of you. And like, um, you, you know, where everyone's budget is kind of, but you don't know who doesn't have the first baseman yet. You don't know who like is, is sort of sneakily waiting for their second catcher. So, uh, taking a break and giving everyone a chance to sort of regroup is a really good idea. I really like that. Yeah. That's from our practical my practical experience from our draft was I was very quiet on day one. I thought saw the prices were really high and I wasn't willing to spend that. But then at the end of the break, uh, during the break, I thought, well, I have to buy some players. I have to have some targets. I have to have a plan. I have to readjust my plan. And as that break was a perfect opportunity to do that. So as soon as we picked up on day two, I knew exactly who I was targeting. I knew the players on the other teams that I knew that they were targeting, the positions and so forth. And I knew who I'd be getting into battle with for all the players that I wanted. So it was a really helpful time to just recuperate and re refresh. So, um, and, and, and I think it also, it gets everybody in the league excited again to do it, right? I mean, yeah. you're, you're starting on day two and there's a lot of momentum to, to begin that second session. So I think that that really helps as well. And, and you're right when you make the point two or more, like it could be three days. It could be, you know, de depending on how your league wants to schedule things, you could split it up over into, in, into three sessions for sure. And I've been in leagues that have done that. Yeah. And especially difficult, it's especially difficult. Uh, when I was in college, it didn't matter. Right. I had all the spare time in the world, but yeah, yeah, right? people right. have I, kids in responsibilities. Uh, yeah. I, I feel that as, <laughs> as someone who is in, I have 10 auto new auctions this year. So um, there, there definitely are those moments where I'm like, uh, do I want to keep doing this tonight? <laughs> so yeah. Exactly. Okay. Let's get on to listen two. Okay. So the auction you, in the auction, you have $400 of budget, but you don't have to spend it all. Okay. Uh, you guys want to just, Justin, yeah, why don't you start? Okay, well, I'll, I'll jump ahead. in here. It's like a little nuanced, right? Because I think, you know, Justin makes this point all the time. Uh, a lot of leagues have a free agent budget and your like initial auction budget, but we have a shared $400 budget the whole year in auto new. Um, so you really want to be careful about having a little bit money extra. Now I just want to like, I'm just going to leave it at this. I never follow this advice. I <laughs> wish That's I good. did, but um, I keep too many players. I'm I'm not very good at auto new. Let's just be honest about that. Like I keep too many players, and I bid too much, uh, and I always end up with only a couple bucks or no money free at the end of an auction. And you know you have to have a plan for that. But uh, if you fall into that situation, but it'd be much better to have like what, what do we say like 15, 20 bucks? Like yeah, I mean 10, 10 to 15, 20. Yeah, somewhere in that range. And and I'm with you, Niv. It's Saying that that's a good idea and, <laughs> and actually doing having it. the discipline to do it is something that I've struggled with as well. It's very hard when you're at the end of an auction and you're like, oh, I want that guy, but oh, I want that guy too. Uh, but I don't I, want, I want him to bid on this guy. You know? I don't want him to get that guy. Right, yeah. right. Um, and I think uh, just to sort of reiterate on the point that, that Nib made as well is in, in most, anybody that's played in auction leagues, typically you have like the common one is $260. You, if you don't spend that money at the auction, it's just gone. So you, you might as well just bid everything you have because it's just lost in the ether if you don't. But that's not the case for auto new. So you have um, not a separate free agent acquisition budget. You don't have a separate fab. It's all sort of that same $400 budget. So if I leave the auction and I have 10 or $15 of unspent cap space, then I can make those early free agent bids or waiver claims 
and not have as much pressure to look. Now I have to cut a $10 player to make room um, because I have that space already. And that's where that advantage can, can come from that you have a little bit of, of flexibility coming out of the auction. And because you're not wasting that money if you don't spend it at auction, you're just reallocating it to in-season moves rather than Pre-season. Right, and and just to make the, the the really correct point, which is everyone knows in the first two weeks there's somebody that you want. You're like way hotter than I thought, or a breakout candidate, or um, this guy's just on a heater right now. I have to snag him and like and ride it out. And um, you know, if you're doing your auction draft in the next couple of weeks, there's still all the spring training to get through. There's injuries that'll come up. Um, so being able to dictate a little of that action. Uh, in in right before opening day and uh, the first couple of weeks of the season is really helpful. Yeah, we uh, we drafted in February and uh, then the start of the season got delayed. And so a lot of people in our league um, had to drop players they didn't want to drop because they needed the money to to fill in their roster. So um, having a little bit of extra cash was uh, was helpful. Um, that's one of the things that I had done in prep was to make sure that I didn't spend all that extra money at the end. I know a few people did. A few people just said, ah, forget it. I'll just go up to 400. And I think they were in a real bind, especially this year with the delay. So um, it might not be easy to do, but it is an important lesson. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so number three, oops, over here. Um now, this is one that I put up there because this is one of the le- biggest lessons I learned. I, I finished second in the league, and uh-huh. I was doing well most of the season. I decided to go for it. I decided to convert my surplus into production. But once I got my production, I didn't have enough time for those players to give me the stats that I needed. So I think I made good trades but I ran out of time. The end of the season came up so quickly that I ran out of time. So I think this is good advice, not just for auto new, but for every league that you're in, if you're going to make a trade, make sure you have enough time to get the benefit of that trade. Yeah. So uh, the one thing I'd add to that is that this is sort of a unique, I I totally agree that it's a a great general lesson, but because, but I'll also add on that because auto new is a year over year league, like you're playing year round and you continue, you have so much continuity Um, there's actually benefit to both sides to making trades earlier. Um, If you're selling and you think your team isn't going to be that great um, and you're like in mid June or late June and you're kind of trying to like make that call, uh, you might get better return uh, for your players. If you make that trade earlier, if you make that sell trade earlier. Um, And then, you know, if you're a buyer and you're trying to win, uh, you, you need those players as soon as possible. You need to get that added production and like fill that hole that like, Oh man, my sh- my team is great, but I'm missing a shortstop. You need to get that shortstop as soon as possible. So, um, I think like that kind of dynamic doesn't necessarily exist in a redraft. Like if you're playing a redraft with your friends or whatever, but Auto New allows you to think about the future when you're when you're building. So, um, so there is benefit to both sides, both parties, in order to make those trades. And, and I think the other point I would make comes down to the availability of trade partners. If you're looking to make a a buying trade to make a push for this year, early in the year, you may not have as many team managers that are saying, yeah, I'm out of it. I'm willing to give up my best assets to, to punt this year and look for next year. So it's going to be hard to do that early because you're just not going to be as many people selling. And then the other side of that is as Niv said, if you are trying to rebuild, Sometimes the best time to make those trades is early in the season because the converse is true where now you have eight managers that still think they're going like to win. Three, four, season. five, yeah. yeah, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and so you your availability of, of, of potential partners is much greater if you're trying to trade away Mike Trout or or Fernando Tatis or something to to get future surplus assets. Sometimes the best time to do that is is earlier rather than later. And of course, you're right, Mark. That does benefit the team acquiring those players if they're doing it early as well because they're getting five months of performance rather than two months of performance. And, and that difference is very meaningful um, when you're, when you're making those sorts of trades. So that's, and I think in general, that's just another concept that you have to think about when you're making those trades in auto new is how much, yes, I'm getting Mike Trout, but am I getting four months of Mike Trout or two months of Mike Trout? There's a big difference there. Yeah. And if you're, if, if in say May you want to trade Mike Trout, you might have more opportunity to get rid of him because by June or July, there could be three or four other managers that say, Hey, wait, before you trade Mike, before you buy Mike Trout, 
Why, can I interest you in my uh, Max Scherzer instead? Yep. Right. It's a supply and demand issue. There's 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 less supply and and more demand. Um, so you have to kind of play that game of when is the best time to sell, and then how do I maximize the return I can get based on what other teams are out there that are willing to acquire the player that I'm trying to sell. Yeah, I didn't think about it from that perspective because I was well, I was one of the buyers, right? Right, right. And if <laughs> and and you're right from a buying perspective, yeah, the earlier the better, but it can be hard to do that because you might find that that too many of the other team managers are like I'm not ready to give up yet, you know. Right. And yeah. They're not and, and it depends on the league. I've I've been in leagues where there are very aggressive rebuilding trades early in the season. Um and but in a lot of other leagues that I play in, no, it, you really are waiting closer to the trade deadline or at least until June or July before some of those big trades go down. So our league has league one, I should say like, which is the original auto new league uh, has been playing since 2005 and we've run the gamut. We've swung the pendulum both ways trade. No one trades up until the trade deadline to someone starts selling in May because they just are like, oh, my team stinks. I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> and so it can really, uh, it, it just, you have to be present and it's super fun because, uh, because any, like even the same group of people will play it different year to year, depending on the roster and the situation. Cool. Um, okay. Let's go on to number four. This is a biggie. Yeah. Uh, av avoid overpaying for prospects. Um, I, I just want to read what Adam Howe ha sent me uh, in preparation for this. I learned to be more selective on how many MILB players to roster and to weigh proximity higher. Paying too much for Wander Franco last year just to see him sit, see myself dropping him without getting any production hurt a bit. And that's what happened in our league is we all overpaid for prospects. Most of them didn't play and most of them got dropped at the end of the year. Yeah. So for this one, it's, uh, we talk about this a lot actually on, on our pod and like, uh, in other contexts. Um, if you're coming from a redraft, like a, a, basic 12 team yahoo public league auto new is a dynasty league if you're coming from a dynasty league auto new is not a dynasty league <laughs> and it just depends on where you're coming from uh there's a huge player universe we you know as soon as players sign uh from the their first year draft uh in major league baseball i add them to the player pool like i manually add them faster than fan graphs gets them in the database so we, we have a huge expansive player pool and it might trick you into thinking that you need to be rostering uh you know your team, your baseball team's uh, first round pick every single year, but that can be a trap. And, it, and it's, it's a trap that takes a little bit of time to learn how to avoid. There are definitely prospects worth rostering, um, but that number, you know, is really more like two or three a team at most. I would say, Justin, what do you think about that? Yeah. And, and it's one of the things we talk about a lot is the price sensitivity. It's not that having those roster, those, those roster spots tied up into prospects is a bad thing. It's not, it's when you're paying $10 plus, um, that's a that's a big investment on a player that it, if there's multiple years before they're even going to see see the field, um, there's an opportunity cost to rostering them both in terms of the cap space and the roster spot. Um, so for me, like I think having prospects is good. You, you're using those as trade capital when you're making those like we were talking about in the last lesson, you're making those trades to try to make a push. Often you need to be able to have some prospects to do that um, because otherwise you're not going to find anybody who's interested because they're looking for the future. Um, but I think it, you have to be really mindful of how much you're paying for those prospects. And you also have to think about how many prospects actually pop up and bubble up during the season. Um, last year was sort of a, an exception because of the unique uh, uniqueness of 2020. But in a normal year when the players are, are playing in the minor leagues, you have prospects that break out and they're freely available in 48 hour auctions on, on Autonew to pick up as a free agent. So you can get very good prospects, maybe not top 15 prospects, but very good prospects for a dollar or two during the season. Um, and I'd rather, I'd rather play in that sphere of prospectum in Autonew than the $10 uh, overhyped top five prospects. Um, yeah. The risk, the risk, role. the risk reward there is just a lot, right? Like it's high variance, right? We all know this about prospects. So um, you have to, I mean, some guys, they just come up and they start hitting right away, but there's plenty of surprises. Uh, in prospect development. So you just really, I, I think you have to, this is a, just a really important lesson that coming into it, you might be like, finally, I have a dynasty league that uh, I can easily play and not have to like manage a bunch of spreadsheets for. Well, kind of like auto new is just not as dynasty -y as you think like that's. Yeah. We, uh, with the 20, Wander Franco went for $20 in our auction. 
Um, that was way too much because at the end of the season, because he played in the minors, he went bumped up to $21. And then he got stung with a few extra allocation dollars. So other managers can out give, we'll talk about it a little bit in a few minutes, but allocation means that we can give Wander Franco, bump him up to $25 or, or $30, whatever we want. At that, at that point, why do you even want Wander Franco? You're not going to get exactly. any realized, like you're not going to get a surprise benefit. He's going to be a $30 player. You should then have to perform like one, which is a high bar, right? Yeah, for sure. And you can pick up a, a guy, you might be able to pick up an Alec Baum off the wa waiver wire in the season as soon as he gets called up. And then you can put him right into your roster, into your lineup, or at least take the chance to see how he goes. Uh, you can do it for cheap. And then at the end of the season, while well, right now anyone who has Alec Baum is thinking, well, I've got myself a quarter infielder for cheap. Right. And a $5 Baum is a much more attractive um asset on your team right now than a $20 Wander Franco, even though Wander Franco is still the best prospect in baseball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not something we knew going into the season. It was something we learned. That's some five. Okay, now this is something I did um, to help elite, to facilitate some trades. Um, there's a pretty robust uh, trade block on uh, at Autonew where you can really explain what it is that you're looking for and what you want to do. Because there's so many different layers in Autonu, people at different stages of of, uh, of uh, in their process towards a championship, sometimes it's not really, you don't really know what other people want or are looking for or are trying to do. So what I found was communicating what my intentions are and what I was looking for was much better than just listing a whole bunch of players that I wanted to get rid of. What do you think, Justin? Yeah. And I think there's, so on that on a new trade block, you have, you have an opportunity to list players that are on your team or even general positions that, that you're looking to trade. But on the other side of that same page is wants. So you can say, I'm looking for an outfielder. I'm looking for a starting pitcher. So I think both of those pieces are important. Yes, you you absolutely should be communicating with the rest of your league via that trade block to say, these are the players I'm looking to move. But also, here's the positions I need help at. Um, yeah, other managers in your league can look at your roster and maybe guess that you need a first baseman. But sometimes it's just a lot. You want to do everything possible to make it easy for someone else to look at your trade block and say, oh, wait a second, I have a lot of first basemen. This guy's looking for first baseman, and I have a need for pitching, and they're looking to trade away pitching. So you're you're just trying to get to a point where it's just making it as easy as possible for somebody else to match up with you um, to make those trades. And it's, it's not always selling and rebuilding trades. Sometimes it's positional trades. If you're talking about rotisserie, then it's, you know, you need steals and someone else needs uh, home runs, and you're making a trade to fill category needs as well. So... Yeah. And then the other thing I'd add to that is, um, I, you know, I think Mark, like it, it's really nice to see that you, like, we, we didn't really talk about this stuff beforehand, you know, like this, these are your lessons, right? So, um, when we like the trade block was not always so robust and it definitely has improved to do the things that Mark has, you've written out here, these bullet points, like these are, uh, driven by the community, driven by people who play auto new to say, Hey, I'm in a public league. I don't know everybody in my league and I can't just send messages to these random people. Like I need a way to start building relationships with them on day one. And the trade block has been oriented around uh, being able to do that kind of thing. So uh, it lets you communicate with everybody at once. Everyone gets an email when you update your trade block. Um, you can just be honest there and you're not trying to trick anybody. And you're creating a transparent way of having dialogue with just everybody. And then there's also like a rich messaging tool if you need to like go deeper into negotiations. So there's um, the, the, the platform, like the game is really fun because of how like, you know, like what Daniel wrote here uh, and what we talked about just the other day, trading is super fun in this, in this game. And a lot of the tools on the platform are built to make that fun and easy because I think having that experience just makes you just want to play out on new and, and nothing else. So, um, the trade blocks built for that. Right. And so it's really, it's, it's really good to see that, um, it's intuitively starting to feel like, yeah, this, this just makes the trading even better and a little, even easier to get going. Um, get, not everyone gets to be in a league with 11 coworkers that all right. love baseball and all think about baseball all the time. Right. So, um, 
I'm really glad that uh, you guys, even though you, you all know each other, uh, were able to take advantage of the trade block. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I found it really helpful, especially when I, I was trying to dump salary at the end of the season. Right. Because I had I had valuable players to other people, but not right. to me. I had I couldn't afford them. So just letting people know that I was planning on dropping some players who were like I, I had to drop Luis Castillo and D DJ LeMahieu. Which right. some managers might say, no, you shouldn't have done that. But <laughs> I needed to because I needed the money. So those man, those players were two that I were able, instead of dropping, I was able to get rid of because I was able to communicate my desires and, and needs to the rest of my league. And the 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 suitors came quickly that, that <laughs> once I posted it. So it was really helpful. Um, oops, did I skip six? Yes, lesson six. Okay, use the auto bench option. So in auto new, um, you want to just tell us a little bit about the uh, auto bench option, option Niv? Yeah, so uh, it's funny that you asked me to because it's because of Justin that it exists. Oh. Uh, Justin and I were at a baseball game together and he showed me all the alarms he has on his iPhone for every time he has to check his lineup. My, my so, Android, not my phone. I'm sorry, on your your phone, <laughs> your smartphone. You Show me all those uh, all those alarms, right? Eight minutes before, eight minutes before, eight minutes before. Any time a game might start uh, in Major League Baseball, and um, you know, ultimately, when you're playing a season long game, not head to head uh, in Auto New, there there are head to head options. But if you're playing any season long scoring, uh, there are games played, innings pitched, limits, uh, every position, and overall pitching. So. You want to maximize those, but you don't want what you don't want, and what can like just totally uh, crush you is if a player, uh, a regular player like a, like a Real Muto or someone on a national league team that plays every day gets a day off and uh, and then pinch hits. That counts as a game played, but it's not enough production. What you want is you want four or five at bats from every game, every start, right? Every uh, batter, batter batter game played. So uh, what we introduced. Uh, very recently, I think, is a button that's at the top of the lineup page. You click it on, and if you if it's enabled, any player that uh, is not marked as starting in the lineup according to our data providers uh, will just be moved to your bench, and that's it. It won't change their future. Uh, it won't change their place in your lineup in the future, but for that day, they'll be moved to the bench, and then you can, uh, if you miss the 705 starts, but you have somebody playing on the West Coast, uh, you can get someone in at third base, a catcher or whatever, and not be beholden to someone uh, losing a game started for for a for a uh, a pinch hit appearance. Uh, it doesn't do anything to pitchers, so I want to be really clear about that. Uh, but it it does uh, affect batters, and I, I think it's been really well received. Justin, like I built it for you. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, and and it, and it serves that function because I I did. He's not. I mean, Niv's not being exaggerative. This here, is right? not exaggeration. I, I, I was sitting right next to you in the Nationals game. Yeah, and it was it was something that was beginning to drive my wife crazy because I'd have to stop in the middle of what I was doing to say I got to go check my lineups because <laughs> somebody might have gotten scratched from the lineup and I need to take them out of my auto new lineup. But now I don't need to do that because I can have it auto bench if they're not in the lineup. Um, the only thing I would say is that you do have to be careful in double headers. Um, because they will not like if you have a player who you want to start, but you know they're not playing in the first game of the doubleheader. If you have the auto bench option on, they will be benched because they aren't in the lineup for game one. Even but, if they play in game two, but even yeah. if they're right, even if they're in game two, they're already on the bench and and you don't get the opportunity to start them. So doubleheaders make it a little tricky, but they're, that's just something you have to be aware of. Um, where if you really want to be able to play them in the second game and you know they're not starting game one maybe turn off the global auto bench button for that day and know that you're taking a risk that other players might, you know, get scratched and be stuck in your lineup. Okay. But sometimes that can be worth it. And, and just to drill down a little bit more on this, this concept of, you know, your games played and, and this is more important in points leagues in the roto format. So the five by five and four by four in auto new, there's not as much pressure to fill your games in your innings pitch because there are rate stats as well as bulk stats. Whereas in the points leagues, every point, is a point and if you don't if you're scoring zero you're not getting an opportunity to score points every, so, every point is a point yes. i know i'm great I, <laughs> it, 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 put that put that on my you know quote that <laughs> clip it and 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 share it around because that's so important to say um but you're losing by not throwing right. you know if you only get to 150 catcher games you've thrown 12 games away that you could have scored points whereas if you're in roto you might not care because 
maybe your batting average is higher than it would have been if you didn't have another 12 games from your your worst catcher on your roster, for example. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to point out that our league was a five by five. So um, it wasn't so we're I'm coming at these these lessons from that perspective. So it might be a little bit different in if you're in points. Um, and that's what I'm going to just talk about a little bit about in lesson seven. Uh, innings and games played limits need to be maximized. OK, and I suppose this is even more important in, in points. Of course, you've just made that uh, that point. But um, I had a. But even though you have to have the max limits, it isn't necessary to put a player in your lineup every single day in Roto. What I ended up doing was I had I had subs to go into the lineup. And so early in the season, I made sure my lineup was full every day. Well, by the second week of, of September, I was pushing up against the limit. And I had to start sitting players in pretty good matchups because I knew I would blow over the limit by before the end of the season. Yeah. So on the, uh, we have tools for this too, because this is obviously like a, a really important point. Um, it, on the stand, on the standings page, there's a graph that will show you the pace line and what every team is at according to that pace line, which is incredibly important context, like just very useful for making midseason trades and also making sure that you know you're not you're not just totally like I'm playing all my bench players today is not necessarily the right play because you're just taking away from your starters right and your starters are going to get to play again um, like if if my superstars all have an off day today uh, I don't necessarily want to fill fill all the slots but you have to just be judicious about it and thoughtful and and I think Auto New gives you enough tools to be able to make the right choices there or at least yeah. informed choices yeah it's a 162 game season but the season isn't 160. 180. No, it's like 180. Yeah, 180 exactly. something. Yep. So if you have your lineup full every single day, you're not going to get to that max. You're, you're going to blow right by it, and you're well, going to wish. And what ended up happening for me is I was at the, the at the point I was leading, and then I watched second place get closer and closer <laughs> and closer, and then eventually pass me because I couldn't put my best players in the lineup because I'd put some bench guy in earlier in the season. Right. The other thing you have to be mindful too is is the opposite problem where you're not filling enough of your your positional lineups day to day, um, whether that's because you just don't have a deep enough roster to accommodate that. But it's a lot easier to make up ground and catch up after being behind pace at catcher and a, and for your innings pitched at the on the pitching side. It's a lot more difficult to do that at the middle infield positions and the outfield position. I mean, you have five lineup spots a day at outfield. And it seems like you should be able to to have five outfielders going every day, but you usually have to have maybe eight, nine, or ten outfielders on your roster to actually be able to maximize that every day. And even though you're right, you don't have to maximize that every day. I feel like those are the positions, outfield and, and middle infielder especially, are the ones that are most difficult to meet your games cap at the end of the year. Um, whereas if you're behind the pace of catcher, there's two catcher slots in the non head to head auto new leagues, but there's still a 162 game cap for catcher. So you're you have two slots, but you, it really functionally is still a one catcher format. Um, but you're able to play two catchers. You know, you could not start a catcher for the first two months of the season, and then have two in your lineup the rest of the way and make up those games real quick. So, yeah, that was one of the positions that I think everybody in our league had was just starting out. two every no most days. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, during the season, season and especially last year because it was a shortened season and so many catchers were getting breaks because of double headers and, yeah. and, and no days off. We just, you could fill the catcher spot very, very quickly and easily last year. Um, lesson eight, roster players with caution. Now this might seem a little bit unusual to have to worry about which players you roster, but because Autonew has salary obligations, you can't just dump players you, that aren't performing or aren't doing what you want. So what do you think about that, Justin? Yeah, that's true. Because what happens is like, if you're in, in, in season and you want to cut a player, um, you're going to get 50% of their salary back um, right away. But then 50% of their salary rounded up is going to be on your roster as a cap penalty. And you only get relieved of that penalty when that player is picked up by another team or you roster them again. You have you can re-auction them 30 days later, so you can't add them for 30 days. Um, so what happens is 
you get into a situation, especially on the lower end, where you have $1 cap penalties for players that just never go away if they're not coveted by anybody else in your league. Um, and that can add that can add up. I mean, it's it's only a dollar, but sometimes you really you look at your roster and go, man, I really wish I didn't roster this guy because now I have him for a dollar forever and as a penalty, and I wish I had that dollar back to plus one on somebody in this in this midseason auction. Um, and I think the other related aspect of this is that sometimes it makes more sense from a roster construction point of view to cut somebody who's moderately priced rather than just your back end players. Um, in a typical league that doesn't have these these is issues, you're just you're cutting whoever you consider to be the least valuable player on your roster. But that's not always the case in Auto. Sometimes you want to cut a player who's has a ten dollar salary because you're getting five dollars of cap relief right away. Um, you're not always just cutting the one and two dollar players to make room. Sometimes it makes more sense to cut the 10, 20, even even higher than that um, players. And yeah, you have to you have to factor in how much you think they're worth when you're making that decision to cut them. But um, it, it sort of creates some very interesting dynamics where you're not just cutting the last, the least valuable player in your roster. You're, you're cutting the least valuable player who also provides you the most cap flexibility going forward. And so. Yeah. yeah the, I, I, I'm not sure if there's like a ton to add to that. I think Justin pretty much covered it, but um, the only other thing I'd say is like, uh, you know, this is by design. Like these are weighty choices in real life. Right. Mm -hmm. And um and this dynamic is like a really interesting one where you have to like really be considered about who you're cutting and why and when um, it's, it's, it adds weight to it in a way that I think is really fun and interesting because it's engaging. Um, but when you, when you look at auto new and you're like, Oh, I'm playing a $400 40 roster spot game, $400 cap 40 roster. It looks like, you know, you have 12 foot ceilings. Like it's like, oh, I have so much room here. And, you find out quickly, like it's like Mark, it's just not true, right? Like you, it's yeah. like you, like it's a deep game, and uh, it, you, it starts feeling cramped pretty quick. Middle seat, pretty quick, you know. Yeah, and we we found that too. With uh, I mean, there were so many good players on the wire that we wanted to add, but we just couldn't. <laughs> it was yeah, and and there was there was, I think a lot of us from other formats are used to you know, not spending up on a pitcher because we want to get those two starters later on. And so we burn and churn. Well, you right. can't burn and churn in auto new very easily. Um, There's some cost to it, right? Like you, you can, but, but yes, but you have, it has to be real targeted and you have to say like, I'm only going to do this for a couple weeks. Um, because otherwise, like you said, like you, all of a sudden you're just out of room. Yeah. And that's maybe something that would you advise to do maybe a little more burn and churn at the end of the season when you're trying to get to your limits? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a play, and and uh, you know a lot of people uh, uh, do try to go because the caps are especially for pitching the caps are soft, which means on the day that you are going over the fifteen hundred innings pitch cap, uh, you can go everything you do on that day counts. So a lot of people try to line up to have fourteen ninety nine the day before, and then like just burn through it on the last day, and then you know. You're not going to necessarily get the highest quality innings, but sometimes that right. doesn't matter, right? Just depending on where you are in the standings, especially if you're in a points league. Especially in points, yeah. I, I tried to do that. I, I did blow over, but I was so nervous on the day, <laughs> the Saturday before. I was like, okay, if Max Scherzer goes nine innings, then I'm this whole plan is <laughs> right, control, right, right, yeah, right, right. So I, I kind of uh, it was a mess. It yeah, and a so mess. it's there's a lot to trade off there, and you don't have as much room as you think. So, but I do think there is room. And towards the end of the season, if you're in a tight race, if you need to do churn, but it, you know, it, it can, it can really break future plans. <laughs> and and I, I think also that, that managers that are new to auto new might think that that 40 man roster really allows them a lot of free, flexible spots to play with. You don't have as much flexibility. You need a deeper roster than you'd think. Um, I think when you're starting out with auto new, you, you under, um, underappreciate how much you really need a deep roster to fill everything and really keep being competitive. Um, and that's another reason why making sure you're not, and we talked about it with the prospect thing. That's another reason why rostering too many prospects can be a hindrance if you're trying to compete because you need those roster spots to, to fill your fifth outfield game every week um, that you need to, to rotate guys in. So um, that's another part of this rostering players with caution is, is you want to have somebody who's actually going to help your team um, 
So, yeah. Okay, lesson nine. Monitor standings and categories needed. Now, this is just important for every fantasy league that you're playing in a roto, especially, well, in roto, it's most important. You need to know what categories you need to gain in the standings. So if you are trailing um, saves by 25 points or 25 saves, there's no sense in investing in saves because you're not going to bump the person ahead of you. Um, and it, it's the same for everything in uh, all the other categories. If you're way ahead in, in um, WHIP and ERA, well, yeah, then maybe you can throw in a guy who maybe has a poor win, WHIP and ERA so that you can get those extra strikeouts that you need to bump two or maybe three other teams in the standings. So that was uh, that's a lesson. What do you think about that, Niv? So um, last year... Uh, I, I was competitive in my league and uh, I ended up winning it. And the result of that is that um, auto new got some new features that are helpful for competitive teams. And <laughs> that's just a one-to-one -one relationship. I, I have to cop to it. It's just the truth. Uh, one of the things uh, I introduced last year is standings meter, which is really good, I think for Roto league. So I'm in a four by four Mark, you guys, you guys are a five by five, right? So, yeah. and that just shows you where you are relative to everyone else. Uh, but it's um, it's spaced accordingly, right? So you can see, am I really close to someone on batting average, or am I actually like way behind? Even though it's just one point, like is the are the people ahead of me close? Are the people behind me close? And um, tools like that, I think, are just really important and helpful because uh, that's stuff that wait. It seems like an obvious lesson to when you write it out. It seems very obvious, but yeah. when you're playing in the season, like. You just are like, oh, these are my favorite players. I'm going to play these players. And these are like, my team is good and I don't care. And you may like the optimization is not it, every stolen base you have over first plate, over second place does not get you more it's points. Wasted. Right. It's wasted. Um, right. It's a total waste. And every home run you have over second place. And, you know, every home run you use to catch up, like if you're 20 behind on the last week, like, or is it best for you? Who is it best for you to put into your lineup in order to optimize and catch up there? And I think um, it seems obvious to do this, but also I, I, I like like I said, I, when I wasn't competing or when I wasn't like up at the top, like I wasn't paying attention to this super hard. And the only reason I did pay, I start paying attention to it is because I would talk to people like Chad Young or uh, other people in my league, but like Chad especially because he's really competitive in all his leagues uh, to start thinking about like well, how should I be managing my team and what am I doing wrong? And the answer invariably is like, I'm just not being efficient with my, with, with who I'm putting in lineup and what skill sets I'm trying to get into lineup. How am I blending all the different skill sets you need for Roto um, especially? It, and this, this lesson is applicable to points leagues in a different way, but we were talking before about being behind the pace or ahead of the pace at certain positions that can play out in the standings too. If you're way ahead on innings pitch pace and your catcher's pace, your your team's going to be second or third where maybe they shouldn't be. That if you had as many games as everybody else or if you were at the correct pace, you'd be more like fourth or fifth. And the opposite is true sometimes too where you have a team that's sort of playing around in sixth or seventh place, but they've got 300 fewer pitches innings pitch than, than the teams above them. So if you gave them credit for that, and those are not that difficult to catch up on, all of a sudden that team looks like a second or a first place team. So that's where paying attention to the standings and, and sort of accounting for those factors when it comes to how many games you've played and how many innings you've accrued uh, matters in the points leagues. And, and I, I see some teams that get off to a hot start because they're pacing ahead on all those those games and innings pitched and they think that they're real contenders and sometimes they're not they're only ahead because they've accrued more of those games and innings pitched than, than the other player the other managers in their league so yeah and if, if you're leading and you are one of the that if you're that person and you're leading you know that it's going to end badly because once right eventually you have to pay third the place catch and, up yes. and that's exactly what happened to me <laughs> i was so far ahead and then everybody just kind of caught right up as I as I le eased off the throttle. Everybody else just, boom, passed yep. me. Yep. Um, not everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this is a biggie too. Um, this has to do with allocation. Uh, we played in a league. There's two different kinds of uh, arbitration in Autonew. We played the allocation version where everybody is given a fixed amount of money that they have to distribute to all the teams. Um, 
the lesson that I learned was, A, it's really important to assign that allocation money early and then go back and revise later on. Okay, what do you think about the, that, guys? Yeah, I think doing it early, what that does is it sort of signals to the rest of your, your league because what happens is when you go into that arbitration page on your league homepage, you can see... You can't see who put a dollar on all those players, but you can see that there was a dollar that it was already assigned. And during the 30 days that, that arbitration is occurring, you can go in and edit those allocations during that entire period of time. So it's very fluid. But by putting some allocations in early, you're signaling, hey, everybody else in my league, pay attention to this guy. This player is a dollar or two dollars and, and they should be a target for more arbitration. Um, because sometimes it, it, if you don't do that, there might be some players that that you think should have gotten allocated allocated dollars that were just missed for whatever reason because they're forty man rosters and it can be hard to identify right all the ones that that are relevant that should get allocation um, and then yeah then and then at the end you want to revise it um, because you want to respond to if everybody else is throwing money on a player and you think that player should have only gotten ten dollars and they're at eleven and you have two dollars on there take those $2 off or take $1 off and move it to somewhere else where you think it's more important to add. So, yeah, I think that the fourth bullet you have there, Mark is just so interesting and nuanced and important. Um, you don't people. So the basic premise of this, for those of you who haven't played auto new is you get to see everyone else's 40 man rosters in the season, 11 other teams, you have to put two to $3 on every single one of those teams, uh, player, uh, roster. So that's two to $3, uh, on individual players. You can put a dollar on three different players, a dollar on a couple players for every other team and everyone else does it. And it adds a, a little bit of inflation to the league sort of pro, uh, built in. Um, a lot of people look at the system and are like, well, I want you to cut this guy. And um, so I'm going to put all my money on this guy. I'm going to encourage, I'm going to signal that I, all this money should go to this undervalued player so that he becomes too expensive and has to go back to auction um, so I can acquire him. Um, that's not necessarily the way you want to do it because uh, what you really want to do is is squeeze teams and make them make tough decisions and make them just not have as much free extra money around. Uh, if you make it easy to cut somebody, like if you make it like, uh, you know, we talked about this earlier and like there's a little bit of talk about arbitration sponge in the comments and talking about Wander Franco, like that's just an easy cut. And that that money is not. Uh, that allocation that you put that people put towards it, it doesn't hurt the original uh, manager who had Wander Franco because he just gets to cut Wander Franco. He gets to, like no one wanted a thirty dollars Wander Franco anyway, so that's fine, right? Um, but if you put a little bit of squeeze on like uh, there's a forty five dollar Tatis and you get them right to like fifty five dollars and like he probably goes for more than that in an auction right now, shortstop like five by five like. He, hit, he does everything. He's an amazing player. But you just reduced the amount of surplus, to use Justin's favorite term, uh, from from like $15 to, to less than $5. And in doing that, uh, you made it harder for the person who rosters Tatis to build a team around Fernando Tatis. And that makes your that makes your life easier, right? That, that's It's a zero-sum game in that sense. Yeah, so I think better, that, for, that fourth yeah. point is just really important. Sorry. Yeah, you're better off to put that money that you would have assigned to uh wander franco into someone like mike skremsky who yeah broke out and had a good season and is is cheap nobody had is, for more has, than a couple bucks or exactly. alec bohm like we talked about like, exactly right and and you know like alec bohm you're not going to get alec bohm to not be that person's starting corner infielder but you are going to make it a little bit more expensive to have alec bohm be that starting and you just have to keep doing that because otherwise yeah. alec bohm will just always just be that person's third baseman forever and that's that's too easy, right? That's right. Okay, lesson 11. Draft room strategy must match in-season management. Now, Daniel Port gave me this, this one. He said that he had a second baseman. Uh, he had a great platoon at second and a great platoon in outfield. But then as the season went on, he got busy at home. He had to go to school, and he didn't have time to optimize that platoon. So he just put the one guy in every day and he didn't benefit from that platoon that he had in the auction room. So he had a plan, but then when it got into in-season management, he didn't have, he wasn't able to enact that plan. 
I think this is also related to something we've talked about a lot on the Autobot podcast uh, with with Niv and Chad and myself is playing to your own strengths, right? Like being aware of your weaknesses, being aware of your strengths, what you like to do when you're managing a, a roster. If you like to make trades, then you can uh, fill up too much on a certain position at auction, knowing you're going to be able to trade that access away. And you'll be able to do that because you are confident in your ability to do so. If you're less confident in that, yeah, maybe you don't take those risks. You don't, you try to keep more balance. And in his case, if, if you're too busy and I, I get that, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, you, you maybe want to have um, more steady performers at those positions that you don't have as much pressure where you have to go in and platoon and do what I do and set those lineup alarms <laughs> to make yeah, sure exactly. you're dropping. You know what I mean? And, and cause you're, even if you're not doing it to the same extent I was because that auto eject is there now, you still have to set those lineups every day. You still have to think about which one you want in the, in the lineup. Um, and yeah, you just, I think it, this plays into that aspect of it where you just have to be honest with where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are as well. Yeah, and it comes to choosing players in the auction too. If you want to have a player who is steady, then pick, because you you don't want to have them in and out of the lineup, then buy that player in the auction. But if you want a player who has really high highs and really low lows, and you're just going to leave them in your lineup every day, then or in, you're not going to catch those highs and then get them out of your lineup for the lows, then just go for the steady guy. You know? Yep. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't want us to sound like we're ragging on Daniel because when we were on the live stream no, just the other day, no, no. I know a lot of life happened at him or whatever. And, exactly. And, exactly. you know, that that happens. Uh, but I think it's a really nuanced, interesting point, too, because um, some people play for depth. Some people play for prospects. Uh, some people will play stars and scrubs. Some people will say, um, I'm going to have like a great pitching staff. I'm going to win on the back of that. I'm going to win via trading, which is like my prefer. Uh, my preference is to go through. Uh, be really active in the trade market. And I think, you know, AutoNuke lets you do all these strategies in, in various different levels and ways and blending them all together. And that's like a really unique thing about AutoNuke. But the point is you have to be coherent about your strategy through the whole arc of the season. And I think that's just, that's hard. Again, that's just like walking away from an auction draft for 15 bucks. Like that sounds awesome. And I'd love to learn how to do that, but, um, but it's, it's totally the right call. hundred percent. Now that leads us perfectly into lesson 12, you know, yeah. have a strategy for next year as soon as possible. Okay. If you are going week to week or month to month in auto new, you're going to struggle. Every decision you make in auto new, has to be made with next month, next the end of the season, next season, and so forth in mind. Otherwise, you're just going to shoot yourself in the foot at some point by making a decision that doesn't line up with a future decision. Yeah, that's totally right. And I think, you know, Auto New is built around exactly that kind of decision making. And uh, we talk about this again on our Autobot pod. We just had an episode where we talked a little bit about uh, being able to rebuild in 18 months and like that being kind of the window of thought. Uh, you don't necessarily need to think five years down the line, but 18 months is, I think, about the right sweet spot. If you're just thinking a couple months out, uh, you're going to walk yourself into a trap. You're going to um, maybe help another team build a, ju a juggernaut, build a powerhouse. You're going to maybe uh, find yourself sort of in a in sort of a death spiral of a team if you like uh, don't make the right keep cut choices looking forward. We talked to, we, when we talk about uh, position previews, we always think about like, well, what's this guy's position now, but what's his position going to be next year? Um, because you could just be like, oh, I don't have a short stuff now. And I don't know when that happened. And you just find yourself in traps. You really just have to be like, kind of always have a long-term goal. I always like, we talk about like, try to assess where you are and where you're trying to go in the next 18 months and what's reasonable and what, but, but, you know, you just constantly check in with yourself and, and again, just be honest with yourself about it. And I think when you do stuff like that, it's it just the the fact that we can talk about auto new in this kind of way is to me just like, this is why this game is the best. Like, it's, I know I'm biased, but it's just like, <laughs> this is exactly like no other game gives you like this kind of time frame to think about things without going too far out or just being not meaningful after the, the last day of the season. And yeah, well, I think we, we uh, if you look at a team like that, it, it mirrors the MLB. It right? tries to, yeah. It tries to imitate that kind of 
thought process, but being a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more churn sure. so that you can, you know, you're not going to uh, tank your team for five years unless you really want to, but no, um, it's quicker, but at, at least he gets the same mindset. I mean, who can, we, we can definitely say that the Marlins have a plan. They have right. a vision for their future and their, the decisions they're making now are going to impact that future. Right. Can we say the same about the Rockies? Like, are they <laughs> no, making decisions? So. Are they making decisions today with the future in mind? Right. Right. And I think maybe the last thing I'll say about this, because I know we're low on time, but the this lesson uh, and thinking this way is, and I, I love bragging about this, is why a lot of players who play auto new end up working in front offices. Um, not because they're playing auto new and they use auto new on their resume. That's not at all what I'm saying. But like <laughs> it, this kind of mindset and this kind of like thinking about baseball, it really aligns with what major league teams are doing, right? And so uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, people who don't play auto new anymore because major league baseball won't let them because they're playing, they're, they're, they're working in front offices. And I'm really happy about that. And I think like, I, I don't know if there's a better endorsement for this game than that from, from my perspective. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you guys both for coming on. Um, these are our 12 lessons. I won't, we've been through them all, but they're there. If anyone wants to do a screen capture, there you go. You can be reached at. Uh, yeah, at Auto New or help at Auto New. If you guys ever want to play Auto New, just shoot me an email and I'll help you get set up. Or, you know, there are my Twitters. What's the best way for somebody to who who's watching who might want to join a team, have a team or get in? Yeah, so if you want to play, uh, my 100% advice to you is to pick up a team in an existing league. Uh, that'll be less uh, overhead, a little bit less to learn on day one. Um, it might sound intimidating to go into an existing league dynamic, but our community is really friendly and really great. And uh, like we talked about with the trade tools, we talked about with some other the messaging tools, a lot of it's oriented around making it easy for you to communicate with a bunch of people who already know each other a little bit. Um, so you can go to um, autonew.fangraphs.com uh, and click claim a team on your user dashboard and you can see the list of teams that are available there. Uh, you can go to community.autonew.com and that's our community forums. There's tons of conversation there and um, I post news there all the time. And uh, a lot of times when there are leagues that need uh, to fill a couple of spots, uh, they'll post there. And that's a great way to engage with the commissioner, learn a little bit about what the attitude and personality of the people you'd be joining is. And that might make it a little bit easier and a little bit less uh, stressful or intimidating to join one of those leagues. So I really recommend that. I think it's like a, it's a communication game above all else. So um, being able to communicate with people is super important. And these, these are the ways to like sort of get into that. Um, and then, you know, as we go through the off, uh, as we get closer to opening day, like I'm sure we'll have new and new, uh, more and more new leagues forming and lots of drafts happening and stuff. So if you're on those two sites, you'll, you'll find out if you want to play, um, more than easy. And, and people can reach out to you directly on, on Twitter and they can do the same for me and I can point you in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, I'm really responsive on Twitter and, you know, Justin's really responsive on Twitter and then, uh, help at autonew.com is my email address and you can. Uh, I email. I'm I'm always on my email. This is this is my life, so I love it. So. <laughs> and Justin, you're, uh, you're still working on the pod. Yeah, yeah. So you got the the Twitter account there that we just added uh, at Autobot Pod, where we talk about auto new specific stuff, and we're doing positional preview right now. But um, yeah, I'll just echo what Nave said. Like, I love talking about auto new. I love helping new people learn. Um, you can you can tweet at me, send me a DM, and I'm always going to be be happy to respond because I think more people should be playing. So yeah. And uh, you're the creator of the Surplus Calculator, and I've got your Patreon up there, too. I so appreciate if, uh, that, yes. Mm -hmm. If uh, you're interested in getting some tools for Autonew and you don't know about the Surplus Calculator, get on it. And, yeah, you uh, gotta you got to learn because it's the best. It's amazing. <laughs> it is. Um, it is. Yeah. Uh, here we go. All right, yeah, I got to kick you guys out. But uh, <laughs> That's no worries. this is awesome. Um, but if you don't know, I was actually part of like an Autonew Fangraphs staff league. I had to bow out this past year, which really pained me. Uh, but I, I did win one year, and so that puts it's only you ahead because of, I took over Mike Exista's team. That puts uh, you ahead of Eno, man. That's you it. should just remember that forever. <laughs> that's right. That's Eno's right. number Me, one. Alex Chamberlain too, and Appleman, yeah, that's uh, good. and Brad Johnson. So you know what? I feel I feel great about it. Uh, but no, I really. It's kind of fun. I was trying to make my own fantasy game. I was like, cool. What would I want it to have? Like as far as scoring settings and stuff. Then I found myself realizing I was essentially just trying to do auto new. I'm like, what am I? Doing? I should we should talk about that sometime. Then. Yeah, that's good. What's crazy? 
Uh, but no, uh, this is awesome. You guys put out such an amazing thing with Adenu, and that that presentation, anyone getting into it, this is exactly what you need. Uh, so really excellent work, and Mark, Justin, Niv, really awesome having you. Thank you guys for being Thanks here. Thanks for having us again. Thanks, Thank Nick. You, Nick. Thanks, Thank guys. You, Nick. Take care. All right.